form pH molecules by the photoprocessing of uh, very small carbon source grains. Um, and then I'll continue uh, uh, and, and trying to, to uh, convince you that uh, perhaps by the uh, photoprocessing of pH molecules you can form uh, fuel rings. Uh, so there was a, a nice introduction on fuel rings by Jan, so it's nice because this has set the context for, for my presentation. Um, and then I'll talk quickly about uh, how the destruction of pHs um, can um, uh, form, uh, you can form hydrocarbons from this photoprocessing of, of pH molecules. So this is not work I have conducted, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, done by colleagues, but I, I, I wanted to insert it here in this presentation because I think it fits quite well. Um, I'll talk quickly also about the uh, ionization of fuel rings, which uh, were discussed, uh, this, this subject, sorry, was discussed by, uh, by Jan already, and, and, and we've seen that there are a few problems with this, uh, um, with this topic. And finally, I'll, I'll try and summarize uh, on, uh, on everything if I have time. Okay, so this is, uh, before I go into the presentation, I just want to say a few words about this nebula, NGC 7023, because I'm going to talk about it a lot in this presentation. Um, NGC 7023 is a uh, reflection nebula, so you have an intermediate mass star, uh, about eight solar masses, I think, or maybe no less, sorry, intermediate mass star here uh, that has formed in um, a cloud of, of gas and dust, which is uh, still surrounding the star. And the star is illuminating the, this cloud, uh, and, and what you see in blue is, is the reflected light from the star. In addition to the, the blue light, you see uh, here, uh, I don't know if you see very well, but uh, these filamentary structures which uh, glow in red, and it is believed that this, uh, this uh, red glow is due to the fluorescence of um, mm -hmm. carbon aseous molecules in the, in the visible. Okay, so um, this is just to uh, describe this object that I will be uh, talking quite a lot about in the, in the presentation. Okay, so this is uh, now back to the pres presentation itself, and the, the first uh, the first part will be about uh, the conversion of very small grains to pHs. So this is NGC 7023 again. Um, this time it's seen in the in the mid infrared at uh, eight microns with uh, Spitzer. Uh, so it's a zoom on the uh, northern part of the nebula. So you have the star here, and you have these uh, filaments here that uh, appeared in red in the in the previous image. And uh, so here, in the, in the mid-infrared, uh, the emission is mainly due to, um, at uh, 8 micron, is mainly due to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Okay, so you see that this, these filaments are extremely bright uh, at, uh, at uh, mid-infrared wavelengths. So um, we also have uh, what we call a, a spectral mapping for this region. So it's, it's another map here where you see that the resolution, the spatial resolution is a bit uh, lower. Uh, however, for each one of these pixels here in the image, you also have a mid-infrared spectrum. And this is, this is one of the spectra that you can extract from these, uh, from these cubes. And, uh, and you see uh, these uh, very nice uh, bands which are attributed to the CC and CH vibrations of pH molecules. So what is interesting when you have this type of data, these, uh, these uh, spectral cubes, is that you can look at the evolution of this spectrum uh, depending where you are looking in the nebula. So what I'm going to show to you now is a, a little movie of the evolution of this spectrum and going from this position in the cube and in a crosscut like this and getting closer to the star. So this is, this is what it looks like. You start with this spectrum and when you get closer to the star, the star sorry, you see that the spectrum evolves and that the, the, the shape uh, is, really, uh, is really changing. Uh, in particular, I'm going to show it again. Okay, in particular, you can see that the underlying continuum seems to decrease uh, and that the ratio between this band, for instance, and this band uh, changes uh, when you're getting also uh, uh, closer to the star. So the working hypothesis we have done here, based on this observation, is that each one of these uh, observed spectra is, is in fact uh, the result of a linear combination of only a limited number of elementary spectra. And that what we observe in the end is uh, different mixtures of the same elementary spectra. And so you can uh, uh, write this uh, in, in, in a mathematical form, which is like any given observed spectrum, x of lambda, is the result of the sum of these products where you have uh, mixing coefficients, which only depend on the spatial position in your data, and these elementary spectra, s of lambda. And it's uh, the sum of these products 
which uh, gives you a spectrum at a given uh, position in your, uh, in your spectral cube. Of course, you don't have only one spectrum. You have a uh, um, um, spectrum for all the positions in your, in, in your nebula. And so you can write this in a matrix form where you list all your spectra and, and say that they are the result of the product of a mixing matrix, which contains all these mixing coefficients, and a source matrix, which uh, contains the elementary spectra. Okay, so this is just uh, uh, the definitions, and uh, I will, I will t for the sake of simplicity, write them uh, in this form. So you have the observation matrix, the mixing matrix, and the matrix of source or elementary spectrum. And of course, the goal is to identify the matrix A and the matrix S uh, based on only uh, uh, the matrix obso observation that we have. Okay? We only have this, and we want to identify A and S. Okay, so that's the problem. Uh, the approach is the following. You rewrite this equation by just saying that W is an approximation of A and H is an approximation of S. And then uh, the way to uh, identify W and H is the following. Uh, you uh, minimize a, a criterion which is either the Euclidean distance uh, between the matrix H and the uh, product W times H or the Kulsbach divergence uh, between uh, X and the products W times H. The way to do this, to optimize uh, this, uh, this criterion, is the following. Uh, you have an uh, uh, iterative uh, algorithm which is the following. You start with uh, random uh, H and W matrices and uh, you uh, update them using these, uh, these update rules. Okay? And, the, and, and this criterion is non-increasing under the following update rules. So when you, of course, when you do this, you have to uh, um, um, start with some settings. In particular, you have to uh, data, you have to, uh, I think this one is, yes, okay. You have to uh, set the number of rows in your matrix H. So it means the number of spectra that you want to extract. Uh, w and H must be positive when you do this. And that's, that's okay because uh, we are looking at emission spectra. Uh, so so there, there's, no, there's no problem here. And uh, you start, as I said, with uh, random uh, W and H matrices. And what is important to uh, mention here is that uh, these results, uh, at least in our case, empirically, we can verify that uh, the results do not depend on the initialization. So no matter how you initialize W and H, you will always converge to the same solution. And this is, this is what we find in, in, uh, in our case. So it's uh, um, quite reassuring that it seems that there is only a unique solution to the, to the problem. Okay, so this is what we find um, uh, at the end for, for three extracted spectra. Uh, these are the three uh, um, elementary spectra that we find. And so what this means is that uh, using this, combining these three spectra, by making linear combination of these three spectra, you can reproduce uh, all the spectra that were in the little movie I have shown uh, earlier. So in fact, uh, since we have the mixing coefficient, we can reproject these mixing coefficients on the, on the sky, and this is what, uh, what is shown here. So uh, what the colors uh, show is, is the distribution of these, uh, of these spectra on the, on the map. So what you find here is that this, uh, in this uh, region here, far from the star, you're dominated by, uh, by this spectrum. When getting closer to the star, you're dominated by this uh, green spectrum. And then when you get even closer to the star in the cavity, uh, here you're dominated by this blue spectrum. And so based on this uh, special distribution and also on, spectral, uh, on the spectral characteristics of these extracted spectra, um, we've proposed the, the, the following scenario where in fact uh, you have uh, here far from the star uh, very small grains or pH clusters and that these clusters are uh, photoevaporated when you get closer to the star into free-flying uh, neutral uh, pH molecules and that when you get really uh, uh, closer to the star here, uh, these uh, pH molecules are, are ionized into uh, pH cations. So this is just a, um, a little drawing of, of how we think this is happening. Okay, so um, now I'll be talking about the, the, the maybe the next step, we can see that as a, as a following step, which is um, how to convert uh, uh, pHs into furanes. And so Jan has said a few words about this, and so I'm going to um, to show uh, why we think that this is possible, in, especially in the interstellar medium. 
So this is again uh, the uh, NGC 7023 Nebula. Um, so again, the star is here and, uh, and you have these uh, filaments here. Um, and, and, and here you have a composite three color image where you see in red the emission of the far in, in the far infrared. And this is due to uh, uh, dust grains at thermal equilibrium. Uh, in green you have uh, the emission at 8 micron, which is due to pH molecules. And then at uh, 3.6 microns, uh, you have um, uh, basically what you see is the emission from, from stars, from background stars and from the, this uh, intermediate mass star here, in, uh, uh, which is illuminating the nebula. So for these two positions, uh, we have uh, high-resolution spectroscopy. In fact, for, uh, for, the whole, uh, for the whole region here, we have high-resolution spectroscopy. And, uh, and, and if you take uh, position one and two, this is what you obtain. Uh, you see here for position one these nice uh, bands which are due to uh, pHs and when you get really close to the star here at position two you, you start and see the um, uh, emission from the C60 molecule at 17.4 and 19 microns. Okay, as I said we have, we have data for, for this whole region in a high resolution spectroscopy so what you can do is uh, actually in a crosscut from, from, the, from these filaments all the way to the star you can derive uh, the abundance of uh, the C60 molecule and the pH molecules. And this is what is shown here. So here you have on the left uh, position one, so that's when you're far from the star. And here on the right you have a uh, position two, so it's when you're uh, close to the star. And what you see is the following, is that uh, the abundance of the C60 molecule seems to increase by about an order of magnitude when you get closer to the star whereas the abundance of the pH molecule in, 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 on the opposite seems to uh, decrease by uh, roughly also an order of magnitude uh, when, you get, when you go from position 1 to position 2 in the nebula. Okay, so what this tells you is uh, most likely that uh, C60 is being formed in the interstellar medium and, uh, unless there is a way you can hide C60 and, and, uh, and then uh, you have a uh, when you go closer to the star, you reveal this hidden C60. Uh, so, but the most likely interpretation is that uh, C60 is formed. And this is a very low density, it's of the, of the order of a few hundred per cubic centimeter. So um, uh, aggregation processes, uh, bottom-up processes are, are completely impossible in this, well, at least we think they are completely impossible in these, uh, in these physical conditions. So of course, uh, the idea is, is, is can the, the, the C60 formation be due to the photochemical processing of pHs, okay? Because you see pHs disappearing and C60 uh, being formed, so uh, of course it's a very natural thing to say, well, maybe you convert pHs into C60. So if you believe this, uh, uh, you find that the conversion efficiency from pHs to C60 is about 0.1% at a, a distance of 15 arc seconds from the star, and on the time scale which is about 10 to the 5 years, so this is the age of the, uh, of the nebula. So basically, you can convert, let's say, about 0.1% of, uh, of your pHs into C60. So this is a not very high uh, efficiency. Okay, so the, the, the scenario we propose uh, for the, uh, the formation of C60 based on, uh, on, bar, on PAS is the following. You first, you start with uh, your uh, pH molecule, which you dehydrogenate, and you form this sort of uh, uh, a mini uh, graphene flake or nano flake. Uh, or dehydrogenated pH, it's the same thing. And then this, this uh, flake will fold uh, if, you if you give it uh, more uh, UV, uh, more energy, which is, sorry, I forgot to mention, provided by the UV photons. Um, it will fold and eventually close into, into a cage, and then uh, this cage can shrink and reach uh, the uh, fuel ring here, or the C60, in this case, uh, island of, uh, of stability. Of course, none of this is new. Um, all these processes have been studied somewhat independently in different fields. Um, the uh, dehydrogenation of pH has, has been studied uh, theoretically and experimentally uh, by, uh, uh, already since the, since the, the, the 90s. Um, the uh, folding uh, here uh, has been studied in the lab as well uh, and, uh, and uh, theoretically. And, and in fact, uh, this, uh, this is more recent and th this, uh, these studies were boosted by the, f the, the studies uh, on graphene. And so this, is, this was really uh, um, uh, in the field of, of graphene stability, people were trying to know how uh, these uh, things would be uh, stable. And, and, so, and so there is interesting work about, about the folding of these graphene flakes. 
And finally, on the, on the shrinking part, I think we will have uh, uh, more about this uh, uh, by uh, uh, Stefan Earl, and also, in fact, uh, about the dehydrogenation. Um, uh, Christine, I think, will talk about this uh, a little bit more also in, our, in our presentation. But so this is just to say that uh, in this, uh, in this uh, evolution scheme, uh, nothing is really new, and it, it has been studied somewhat independently in different fields, and that this is just uh, getting uh, things uh, um, together. Um, of course, this is uh, just a, a proposal, and you have to uh, try and evaluate uh, if this is possible by uh, using a photochemical model. Um, so what we have used here is the photochemical uh, model of uh, Montillo, Joblin, and Toublanc. And uh, so I think maybe Christine will say a few words also about this in our presentation. Uh, but basically, very quickly, the, the model studies the time evolution of paths in fixed physical conditions using a rate equation formalism. And uh, so the UV absorption and the infrared emission are explicitly, de explicitly described, and, uh, as well as the internal energy of the molecules. So the reactions we include in this model, which was originally made for, uh, for studying the dehydrogenation of PAHs, uh, are the following. Uh, so we include, indeed, the uh, first step, which is the dehydrogenation of, of uh, PAHs. Also, I forgot to mention that in this case, we only study one species, which is uh, circum ovalin, C66H20. Um, so you first dehydrogenate your uh, circum ovalin, okay? And then uh, the second step is folding uh, the uh, planar C66 into a cage C66. And then you have all these uh, different steps of uh, losing C2 units until you reach uh, C60. And C60 can also be uh, destroyed into uh, uh, C58 and you can continue the cascade like this. Uh, for all these reactions, we use what uh, at least we think is state-of-the-art uh, uh, parameters for the, uh, uh, for the, um, uh, for the, the, the rates, uh, for actually for the parameters for the Arrhenius equation, um, which are, which are the, the following. So they come from different sources. Uh, uh, I think these ones come uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, laboratory experiments. Uh, these come from uh, uh, molecular dynamic uh, simulation. These uh, activation energies here come from qu quantum chemistry calculations. And here we have a range of values for uh, the pre-exponential factors uh, because uh, in the literature there is no consensus on what is really the correct value to use. So uh, we use a quite a large range of, of uh, pre-exponential factors here. But I mean, this is something that we can discuss. Okay, in addition, uh, we use uh, the physical conditions in NGC 7023, uh, which uh, uh, maybe here, contrary to planetary nebula, it's easier to uh, know uh, a little bit better the physical conditions. Uh, in particular, we were able to derive uh, uh, the density profile in the nebula uh, based on Herschel observations. The radiation field is, uh, can be derived quite well based on the, the spectral type of the star, and then uh, the, the other physical parameters, such as gas temperature, molecular and atomic hydrogen abundance, are derived using the Modon PDR code. Okay, what I show here is the density profile. Uh, so the, the blue is the, is the uh, observed profile derived from, from dust emission, in fact. But this is the density of the gas. Um, and uh, the red line is just a fit, uh, exponential fit to this, uh, to this observed profile. And this is what we inject uh, in, the, in the model. Okay, so uh, these are the results for the model. Um, what is shown here is the um, evolution of the abundance of different species as a function of time and for four different positions in the nebula. So either at five arc seconds from the star, so this is very close to the star where the radiation field is very strong and the density is low. And then you have a 10, 15, and 20 arc seconds from the star. And so it means that here the density increases and the radiation field decreases when you go from this upper panel to this lower panel. So we can focus at this, uh, this first panel here, this upper panel, and look at what is happening. Uh, you start with uh, your uh, circum ovaline molecule here. And after very quickly, actually, uh, you will uh, completely dehydrogenate it in, uh, in this very harsh environment and you will form this, uh, this uh, fully dehydrogenated uh, uh, pH. What will happen is that very quickly this thing will uh, fold actually uh, and, and form a, a closed cage like this 
And this cage can survive for a relatively long time, for about uh, a few thousand years. And then eventually you will start uh, losing uh, C2 units and cascade down until you reach uh, the uh, C60 uh, state. Okay, what is indicated here uh, with this vertical line is the age, uh, estimated age of the nebula. And also I forgot to mention, and I don't know if you can see very well, very well sorry, but the, the shaded regions here uh, indicates the, uh, um, the, the range of values uh, that correspond to the range of exponential factors that we have put in the model. So like the, the solid lines here uh, are like the most pessimistic case and the upper uh, region here of this uh, shaded region is the most optimistic case. But basically, so what you see is that it's, it's relatively difficult to form a C60, but uh, in, in a time scale of 10 to the 5 years, you indeed, when you're close to the star, you, st you start to have um, uh, reasonable abundances of, of the C60 molecule using this mechanism. So what is interesting also is that uh, because of the high activation energy needed in the reaction to dissociate uh, C60, uh, you see that uh, basically once you form C60, you will never destroy it. It will take you the age of the universe to destroy it. Uh, this can be seen, for instance, with this. So this is the this blue line here is the abundance of C56, which is one of the product of the photo uh, destruction of C60, and you see that you really need an incredibly long time to to start and form it. And so th this uh, uh, shows that indeed that uh, the C60 uh, is, is, is very stable, even in its interstellar conditions. OK, so some, some conclusions about, uh, about this part. So pHs are quickly destroyed near the star. Uh, that's, that's what we seem to, to find. Uh, and so they are fully dehydrogenated. And these dehydrogenated pHs are unstable. So, I mean, we will probably not uh, detect them uh, because they will fall very quickly. At least that's, that's what we find here. The shrinking process is what takes uh, really the, the, the longest uh, in, in the shrinking to uh, so this uh, sort of uh, floppy cage to the symmetric C60. And the uh, C60 is also uh, in, uh, almost never destroyed. And maybe that's why we see it uh, in the interstellar medium. And the conversion efficiency in the model, uh, assuming that all pHs are C66H20, which is a very strong assumption and is, of course, uh, probably not right, is that about 0.1% uh, of, the, of these molecules can be converted into uh, C60 in about 10 to the 5 years. So uh, at least, I mean, of course, uh, this is uh, not representative of, of all the pH family in space, but at least this uh, order of magnitude seems to be comparable to what we have in the, in the observations. So this is just sort of a, a proof of concept that this can work in a, a, that the, the, the uh, destruction of pHs can lead to the formation of C60 in space. But I think it's hopeless to, to try and do a model which will include all the molecules and, uh, uh, well, at least so far we haven't uh, succeeded. OK, so um, now I'll spend a few minutes talking about the uh, conversion of uh, pHs to uh, small hydrocarbons. So this is the only time in my presentation where I don't talk about, uh, about NGC 7023. Uh, this is the Horsehead Nebula. So you have a, 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 a molecular cloud, uh, so a cloud of gas and dust that you see here in, this, uh, in dark. And um, it's illuminated by a star, which is uh, called Sigma Orionis, and it's situated somewhere here. And it's illuminating this cloud. And uh, what is shown here in the, in, the, in the right panels is for a crosscut that is uh, shown here in red in the nebula, uh, the uh, intensity emitted by uh, different molecules. Okay? So in this upper panel, you have the C18O molecule. And then uh, uh, in these uh, uh, three panels here, you see the emission from these uh, hydrocarbons or radicals. And then in the bottom one, you see the emission from pHs. And so what the authors of this, uh, of this work have shown is that, uh, in fact, you find uh, so, uh, the uh, C18O molecule peaks really in the inner parts of the, of the cloud, where it's very cold and where very, UV, very little UV um, uh, radiation penetrates. And then uh, these uh, small hydrocarbons seem to be found on the, on the, more on the surface of the cloud, okay? so more to the right on this, uh, on this uh, image. And, and, and they peak apparently very close to uh, the uh, emission of pHs. So what they have suggested um, is that, in fact, um, 
uh, maybe these uh, uh, hydrocarbons are formed from the, the uh, photolysis of the pH molecules. Okay. So the last thing I want to uh, talk about is the ionization of, uh, of fuel rings. Um, so Jan has already shown this um, in, his, in his presentation. Uh, so in 1994, there was this, uh, this uh, proposal by uh, Fon and Ehrenfeld that uh, the, the diffuse interstellar bands observed uh, towards a different line of sights at uh, 9577 and 9632 Angstrom could be due to uh, the absorption of, uh, of the C60 cation uh, uh, in space. Okay, so the, there is, there is uh, quite some debate about, uh, about this and, and related questions. So the, at, at, at the first thing, uh, as Jan mentioned, is that the identification of C60 plus is based on a coincidence with uh, um, uh, absorption bands. And it's, this is questioned because uh, uh, it, it's not gas phase uh, spectroscopic data. Um, in emission, uh, we have seen that uh, C60 is seen everywhere and uh, C60 plus seems to be uh, in nowhere, basically. Um, is C60 in the gas phase or in the solid phase? So you can look at the discussion uh, uh, in the paper of Hieronimo about this. Um, and, and also maybe more generally, uh, the definitive proof for the existence of a specific gas phase carbon molecule, uh, and, and so this is like the whole pH model behind, uh, this has not really been proven yet. And actually there is still some some discussion uh, recently on the on the validity of the the pH model. Okay, so uh, back to NGC seven hundred two three. Um, here, what I show in this color composite image is the emission of uh, different uh, species. So you have molecular hydrogen in blue, which uh, is situated uh, in this region here, far from the star. So what you see really here is the uh, surface of the molecular cloud. Then you have the emission from pHs in the, in the regions which are closer to the star. And then really in the inner regions, very close to this uh, illuminating star, you have uh, the C60 emission at uh, 90 microns, which is uh, dominating. Well, not dominating, but which is uh, very small. If you take a spectrum uh, at this position here in the nebula, what you see is the, the following spectrum. Uh, and you recognize these, uh, these uh, bands from uh, the pH molecules. Now, if you take a spectrum at this position two here, which is really at the edge of the field of view that was observed with, uh, with Spitzer, so it's like the position, the closest position you can find to this illuminating star, you see this spectrum, which is uh, very similar to the one at position one, except for a few tiny features, which I have indicated here with this, uh, these uh, red lines. And you have a band which is at 6.4, a band at 7.1, a band at 8.3, and another one at 10.5. And so these bands are uh, present really only in the uh, immediate surrounding of the, of the illuminating star, whereas neutral C60 is, is a, a little bit more extended around the star. So again, uh, the astronomical interpretation is, is, is the following, is that in fact when you get really close to the star, perhaps uh, you can finally ionize uh, the C60 molecule and that these bands are due to uh, the ionized form of uh, the cationic form of C60. So this is just the uh, astronomical interpretation, but then you have to do a bit of spectroscopy to uh, uh, back up this, uh, this proposal. And so the, this is the um, uh, superposition of the observed spectrum uh, with the uh, uh, indicated uh, here the bands that uh, we have detected. And, uh, and below here, this, uh, this uh, blue spectrum is what is calculated from uh, the density functional theory. So uh, Giacomo con conducted these, uh, these calculations. And here I have to say that this spectrum, this theoretical spectrum is scaled in frequency to laboratory data that was obtained by uh, uh, Bastian Kern uh, uh, recently. Um, so, okay, so we don't have uh, an emission model for C60. Uh, it's uh, very difficult, in fact, to have one. Uh, uh, and for C60 plus, it will be even more difficult. Um, so it's a, a little bit hopeless to, to try and do this, but just the harmonic spectrum uh, matches the observed position uh, with a 2% accuracy, which is, in fact, uh, uh, quite good. The bands with the strongest intensities, 
uh, are also, well, the four, the four strongest bands are actually the ones we see, okay? So that's quite reassuring. Uh, what's predicted to be strong by theory is what we see. Um, um, I think that's all I wanted to say about this. Um, based on this, uh, on this observation, you can derive an ionization fraction uh, of C60. And we found that about 38% of the C60 is ionized. And so the abundance uh, that you can derive from this observation is that uh, about 10 to the minus 4 of the elemental carbon would be in, C in uh, C60+. Plus. So this is much smaller that w than what is uh, reported in, in uh, Foin and Ehrenfreud. But I have to mention that their detection concerned the diffuse interstellar medium. Okay? So this is a very different uh, environment which we are looking at. Okay. Some conclusion or discussion about, about C60+. Plus. Um, so about this uh, identification in the, with the diffuse interstellar band, um, okay, we seem to be confirming that C60 plus is also, can also be seen in emission. Uh, however, uh, it would be nice to confirm um, this in other objects, uh, and so far this has not been possible in, in emission. And, and, and also uh, for absorption, uh, um, it would be nice to have uh, gas phase laborat laboratory data to uh, confirm the identification. Um, so in emission, uh, here I mentioned that we had only seen C60 and not C60+. Plus. So now we claim that C60 plus is present in NGC 7023. But so the question is, why can we only see it in this object? As Jana said, uh, they have not found uh, C60 plus in any of the uh, planetary nebula that they have observed. And maybe one possibility is that uh, this parameter, uh, G0 over NH, where G0 is the radiation field and NH is the... Uh, um, density of at atomic hydrogen, this parameter is equal to 100. So it means that uh, you have uh, uh, a very strong radiation field and a very low density. Um, and, and, and this means that uh, the, available, the availability of electrons will be very low. And so uh, maybe the, the secret is that you need to go to environments where you have very, very few electrons and, uh, and only in this case C60 plus can survive. And in fact, uh, uh, something that we don't know, I don't think this has been measured in the lab, maybe uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the electron recombination rate uh, with C of C60 has been, uh, has been measured in the lab. So this is something that uh, we might, be bec because in the same environments we see that all the pHs are ionized. So this is a little bit surprising. Uh, to the question, is C60 in the gas phase or in the solid phase? Um, if you believe that uh, this detection of C60 plus, uh, it's hard to imagine that it is in the solid phase. So uh, in this case, it means that you have actually a molecule which is uh, free-flying, isolated, and that it's uh, excited by, uh, uh, by uh, individual UV photons. And of course, uh, then this would be like a, a, a detection of a specific molecule which is, uh, emit, uh, which is emitting after the absorption of single UV photons. And so this sort of backs up the, the pH uh, model. Okay, um, I'll now summarize all this. So um, basically, uh, you start, I think uh, that's what I was showing in the, in, the, in the first part of this presentation, you start with uh, what we call very small grains, and they could be pH clusters, but I mean, it, it's unclear what these very small grains can be. Uh, in particular, you, you can imagine that they are not beautiful pH clusters like this, but that they can have some uh, um, aliphatic chains, or, uh, and they might not be uh, as symmetric and beautiful as this. But basically, you, so you take these grains, and under UV radiation, you evaporate them, and, and you, you make uh, free-flying pH molecules. Um, upon further irradiation, uh, you can either uh, ionize uh, your uh, molecule, or you can uh, dehydrogenate uh, the molecule. So if you continue with even stronger UV field, what will happen is the following. Uh, you will uh, fold this uh, uh, dehydrogenated pH into uh, a fuel ring. And then like really the dead end, uh, the further you can go seems to be uh, the uh, uh, ionized uh, fuel ring. Okay, in addition, of course, there are many other things happening, as I've, as I've mentioned quickly. Uh, you can fragment these, uh, these uh, species into, uh, for instance, uh, aliphatic hydrocarbon or radicals. 
uh, and these, these uh, uh, sort of graphene flakes, in particular the ones that are smaller than, uh, let's say, uh, um, I don't know what is the smallest fuel range, but uh, smaller than uh, 24 or, or 60 uh, carbon atoms, uh, they, will, uh, they will fragment and form these chains. And, uh, well, I don't know how stable these would be in, in this kind of environment, but so maybe eventually you can just, uh, uh, they can go back to uh, atomic carbon. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? So just as a kineticist, I have to comment about your, your A factors in your model. Mm -hmm. um, so normally people think that A factors can't really be fat much faster than KT over H, um, which would be numbers like 10 to 14 per second, something like that. Please. So this C2 elimination. Um, another way to look at it is to look at the reverse reaction and just assume the hard to lose rate for C2 is applied with those KVS, you can like that. So and you know the thermochemistry, so you know you can estimate the delta S. Okay, so for the reverse reaction, um, here uh, the, the density is extremely low. So yes. once you eject No, no, just sorry, just for the to do the thermodynamic calculation of how fast the A can be. Yes. You can use the equilibrium constant, you can estimate the thermochemistry, all you need is the entropy. Okay. And then the, um, the reverse rate of the fastest it can be is the collision rate. Yes. Which you can estimate also. Yes. Then you can do the equilibrium constant. Yes. Reverse. Right. Yeah. The highest A factor, the highest A factor you'd be able to be about 10 to 14. Okay. So those ones. Okay. Other questions? Did you make actually some error calculations or was in the TPT analysis how much the A factor, I mean at least within this parameter influences your the results of your models? Yes, so um so, so here, at least, there is a, a range of values, okay? And this, this range of values turns into these uh, um, shaded regions here in the... Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry, it's hard to see on this, on this plot, yeah. Uh, but there, there is this very uh, light uh, shaded regions here, which show the intensity. Yeah. So, in... in your models, you see a clear evolution from BAHs to fullerenes. I'm mm. wondering if, if when you make the spatial cross cuts and then you see seven to three, whether, mm. whether you see observationally as well that 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 you also remove the BAHs mm. and because I have the impression from afar it looks that that even the spectra of FC60 still have very strong bar emission. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> if you look at the observations, you're right. I mean, when you, when you get to this position very close to the star, you see indeed C60, but you see also still uh, pH emission. And including, you see this, uh, this uh, CH band here. So it means that not all pHs have been dehydrogenated and not all of them have been destroyed. Uh, there are two ways to um, sort of uh, uh, reconcile uh, the uh, observations with the, the model. The first thing is that you have the geometry here. So th this thing is not perfectly edge-on. You have a sort of a spherical geometry. So on your line of sight, you always will have some pHs toward the star. Okay. Um, so this is the first thing. So it's, we would need to uh, um, do a geometrical model to uh, see um, how much of the pH emission that you see here is coming from your line of sight and is in front and not really at the position of the star. The second thing is, uh, I mean, when you look at the abundance of pHs, still, I mean, th you see that there is a, an order of magnitude decrease in the abundance. So, you, you, I mean, you de destroy uh, quite a large uh, fraction of, of your pHs. However, uh, the largest ones, you may not uh, be able to destroy them. Um, depends how large they, they, they are, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the first step, the dehydrogenation step, um, it depends on the size of, of your pH. If you have a very large one, you may not be able to dehydrogenate it. But I guess it has to be very, very large. Yeah. Uh, Laura, question. <coughs> Do you see any um, spatial changes in the ratio of the C60 bands? Ah, in these uh, two bands? Mm -hmm. um, okay, for, so for these two bands, it's, you know, you know this, it's tricky because in fact you also have a pH band at 17.4 micron. 
Um, so, do you see uh, an evolution in the ratio? It's hard to say, but I haven't looked at it specifically. Yeah. Different spectra would be interesting. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yes. Good point. So, the beginning, you showed us a nice um, three spectra that you had extracted. Mm -hmm. Can you assign those peaks, what they are, and, what, what that, and, and do they make sense as a kind of these, yeah. Um, okay, so um, of course, what I have shown here is is, is really the mathematical decomposition. Uh, but there is, uh, you know, there are spectroscopic arguments to, to back up the uh, the assignment that we that we make. Um, in particular, uh, for instance, for for the uh, the cations uh, here, you see that the uh, um, this 11.2 micron band is uh, very weak compared to the, for instance, this uh, 7.7 uh, micron band, especially when you compare to the, the neutral pHs. And this is something that is known from, from the FT calculation and is known from, from, from the lab as well. This has been, uh, this has been measured. Do you, uh, do you have a sense of how big the pHs are, or that's not determinable? For the here? For, from the for, data? For any of the three, yeah. Well, you know, the, the, okay, so the, the problem with uh, these emission spectra is that uh, so far uh, we don't have a you know a complete emission model yeah. for pHs uh, for interstellar pHs. So determining the properties of pHs in interstellar space is extremely difficult because we don't have a specific identification. So based on this, I mean it's difficult to say something. Uh, there is a lot of literature and everything seems to point to large systems. And also stability um, uh, considerations also seem to point to large systems because the small one you will destroy very quickly. Uh, but based on this, it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, in fact, there is a, a, a recent study by um, the group of Luala Mandola where they studied the same region. And, and, and they say they can uh, sort of put constraints on the, on the size based on the use of their theoretical database. Um, yes. No further questions? Let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you.